What's up, gang? It's Ray from the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'd like to thank you all for coming today and enjoying what I hope will be a really great show with four awesome reviews. Well, I don't know about the reviews being awesome, but four good books. Uh, and so you may may learn a little something and you may enjoy a little something, but I don't know. But today, I will say this. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. My name is Ray, and you will be enjoying several classic or current lit RPG audiobooks reviewed it for you at my leisure for your pleasure so let's get right to it shall we gang all right so this is the first segment of the show today and I, I want to do something a little bit different usually I introduce the book then we go to a clip and then we come back to my review what I want to do is I'll introduce the book then I'm going to say a few things real quick and then let you hear what I'm listening to and why I say what I say and then I'll come back and do my review. So the first book we're doing today is Starter Zone, The Revelation Chronicles, which is book one by Chris Pasevic. Uh, it's narrated by Natalie Heng, and it is a book length of four hours and 42 minutes. So again, we're, we're not going to cut right to that. So, so here's another book that is hampered by the narration, the narrator. Um, and I, I don't say this very lightly, but I want you to hear how this is said as we go through this so that it doesn't, you, you know... You're not just thinking I'm pulling inside of my ears here. Hang speaks very clearly and enunciates fine, just fine. Although there are multiple times that she mispronounces very basic, or at least what I felt to be basic words. Now, I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to give you a list or a litany of things that she did wrong. Just, just trust me on this. And all of that, that can be forgiven. I usually say, you know, yeah... The only time I really have a big problem with that is like if the word is numerous and it's repeated multiple times, and like like there was the the, the Nova online book that said N signs instead of ensign, and I would have even let that slip, but it was like ensign 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 the whole way through the book, but they weren't saying the word ensign, it was N sign, and that drove me insane. And the book was fantastic. I loved the book. Uh, and that's why I haven't gone and like reviewed book two because I was told by the writer, uh, the narrator did the same thing again in book two. I don't know if book three is out yet. I'm kind of leery as much as I really like the story and want to go back to it to get into there. So anyway, like I say, all that can be forgiven. I, I will let a narrator slip past, you know, mispronounced words. Uh, you know, I never know. Like I say, I've, I've said it before. There are sometimes I wonder if English is a first language because you, sometimes a good narrator can lose an accent. And, and I don't trust that just because they don't speak with an accent that I can readily identify or hear that they aren't a native-born uh, person of the United States that speak English as perfectly as all of us people here in the United States do. You know, I, I, I know we don't. We all have our foibles, but simple words are mispronounced. So I let that slide, okay? But she kind of reads the book like it's one of those old original books on CD, like if you, if, you know, the compact discs, if you ever went back to an audio was in its infancy and, he, and you would hear like, I'll give you a really good example. Um, Terry Brooks has like one of my favorite books of all time for fantasy and it's the Elf Stones of Shannara. And if you ever, ever, ever get to listen to the original audiobook recordings, which I had on cassette, so it's even before CD, I had them on cassette. The narrator literally gave no life to the story whatsoever. It was kind of like that, 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 that. That's how the story went. Just rhythm, you know, pow, 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 pow. No intonation, no, no, you know, changing of voices, nothing. It was very, very simplistic and basic. And back then, I guess no one realized you could actually act as you, you narrated. So th that was like one of the biggest letdowns for me early on because I had read that book a thousand times and I, I so wanted to hear it on audio and then when I got it I was like oh god this guy just slaughtered his book and this reminds me of that the way that the, the 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 words just don't have any life to them very simple very basic just listen to them talking and I'll, I'll point out what I was talking about here okay so if you could we'll go to the clip right now we pause at the end of the grouping of cars there is a four-block stretch of open street between us and the next accident. I stare hard at the seeming emptiness. 
Would it be better to make a dash for it down the center or hug the side? There are no sidewalks on the street, only a gutter. This part of the city is mostly residential. Stores and mini-marts compete for position, with drooping old Victorians behind wooden or chain-link fences that press almost up to the roadway. The stores have large glass windows in the front that reflect a harsh glare when the final rays of the setting sun hit the surface. The houses loom deep and quiet in the shadows. There's two colors of paint, Albie whispers, pointing to the spray-painted walls of the stores. I nod. This area is contested. At least two gangs are trying to take control of the neighborhood. Stay away from the buildings, I whisper back. It will be safer in the street. Okay, so you kind of have an idea. Hang infuses literally zero emotional life into a reading, and it drains the tail of all its power. When she said, would it be better to make a dash for it or hug the sides, instead of saying, like, would it be better to make a dash for it or hug to the sides of the, the streets? She doesn't say it like that. She said, would it be better to make a dash for it or hug to the sides of the street? There, there's no question in that whatsoever, and it was a question that was being asked by the character. The character is asking themselves a question, and it never comes across that way. It's very just, yeah, and it drives me crazy. It doesn't feel like she's concerned or even gives a damn about what's happening in a story. It just kind of just feels like I have to say these lines. I will say these lines as perfectly as I can, as clearly as I can, and tell the story this way. That's the way it sounds to me. And I don't like a story that's told like that. I have a bit of a standard when it comes to narration. And I can say uh, uh, there's a person that's mediocre to a person that's great to somebody that just, they, they just, it's scrambled eggs. And I'm not saying she's scrambled eggs. I'm just saying she does not give the story its due by the way that she reads the story. And I hate to say this sort of stuff. And I, I've done this a couple times recently. And, and again, I always have to be honest. I have to tell you, here's how I feel about this. And I don't want to crush anybody. And, and that's where I say, like, I'm being cr constructively critical here. Miss Heng, when you read a story, you kind of have to ask how these, like, you can't just read the words as you go and say, that's it, I'm done, I'm, it's all over. You kind of have to read it ahead of time, get a feel for what the story is, what the, the character is like, what the situations are. And then apply that as you read it. Like, would it be better to, to make a dash for it or hug the sides of the streets? It's a simple line. It's a very simple line. But it, it has no context whatsoever other than the characters going, would it be better to, you know, uh, go down the street or hug the sides of the street? I don't know. There's no, there's nothing to it to indicate there was like any kind of concern on the character's behalf. Okay. She's good at reading words and, and, like I say, stringing the sentences together. She does a good job at that. But it's really, it's just really, it's not enough. It's not enough. Um, the entire time I listened, I felt like this book's audio portion was on a respirator and the vitals were dropping. Bing, 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 bing. And it didn't flatline, but I just kept seeing it go down. Like, boop, 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 you know, like that. Hang doesn't kill the story. Not by any means, but she does nothing to give it life and that is the sign of a good narrator i need to see some hint that there is something going on besides just reading i really do um she was given a color by numbers painting and chose to make every number blue that's how i look at it it's just it was a simple thing now i'm going to do something i've never done before and i'm going to read the book blurb and add in my thoughts as i go so i know ramon does this he'll read the book blurb and then um you this his review and i'm kind of kind of going to do that but not all the way um so let me start into it um here's here's part of the blurb i have to read it so when hydrolysis hydrologist hydrologist inscribe the consciousness of human mind onto a single drop of water a revelation sweeps the land the wealthy race to upload their minds into self-contained virtual realities named nicknamed aquariums in these containers, people achieve every hope, dream, and desire. But governments wage war for control of the technology. Terrorist attacks cause massive panic. The aquariums fail and inscribed human minds leach into the water cycle, wreaking havoc. Now, just right off the top, I'm going to say, like, this is a really cool concept. 
and one that I would have liked to see fleshed out a bit more. It really is never said how personalities living in the water can take over a body. And if you think about it, if there's a personality in a single drop of water, and there's a lot of water, how many personalities get into a body? How do they vie for control? How do who you know? There's a lot of stuff that's kind of overlooked in, in certain details if you if you look at it backwards, if you take a take a step back and look at it. You know, I don't, I don't want to call it plot holes, but there's no no real descriptions for a lot of stuff that could be described and would give more flavor and flex of muscle to the story. Okay. Like I say, uh, neat, neat concept, neat concept, but needs fleshed out. So here's another part of the blurb. Street gangs rule the cities during the three years since the fall of civilization. 16-year-old Cammie and her younger sister, Albie, struggle to survive. Every drop of untreated water puts their lives in peril. Caught and imprisoned by soldiers who plan to sell them into slavery, Cammie will do anything to escape and rescue her sister even if it means leaving the real world for a life in the realms, a new game-like reality created by the hydrologist for the chosen few. So this is one of the few stories where the real world is more oppressive than that of the game world. Uh, and the one that I think is a really prime example uh, that readily springs to mind is Dave Wilmar's Dark Elf series. Now, I love the Dark Elf series. Uh, and, and that was a bleak and unrelenting universe of hopelessness uh, where the game was the only thing to keep the survivors going. I mean, like, you're out there struggling to survive, and then at the end of the day, you come home and you kind of relax and get into a world where you fight with swords and sorcery and, and so on and so forth, and you fight monsters. But it's more relaxing doing that than it is to exist in the real world. Um and I always say, you know, the game world was very interesting and the real world were very interesting. And I, sometimes I would say the real, real world is more interesting than the game world just because of the, the, the concept was so, so highbrow. You know, it was, it was great. I loved how it worked. And yeah, I, I pointed out flaws in the concept of that world to Dave at, in one of my reviews. And I still loved it. Okay. Like I say, you take a step back, you'll see some plot holes or you'll see something that doesn't work. Not everything is perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect to be good. Okay. So I'm stepping back over here. Here, the girls kind of almost luck into the game world. Uh, and, and getting there the way they did is kind of a real stretch. I mean, like, stretch, stretch. Stretch Armstrong kind of. No, no. If you're fans of Marvel, Mr. Fantastic. If you're DC, Plastic Man or Elongated Man. Um, but you get the picture. It's a stretch. Okay. Um, I will say this. The issues in the real world are infinitely more intriguing and riveting. So that tells you something right there than what happens in the game world. I mean, you know, honestly, if it's, it's way better in the real world, why are we going into the game world? Because the game world kind of doesn't hold my attention half as much as the real world. Uh, like I say, with Wilmarth, I enjoyed the game sections just as much, maybe a little bit less than the real world, but if, if it was just the gaming stuff, I would have loved the book all into itself just based on that game. Period. Okay? So, you know, the, sh the, the story shows like a lot of, of premise and creativity, and I was really hoping that would carry over to the gaming section. So here's, here's another bit of the blurb. This is a long blurb, by the way. But life in the realms isn't as simple as it seems. Magic, combat, gear scores, quests, and dungeons are puzzles to be solved as the sisters navigate their new surroundings and they encounter more dangerous enemies than any they face in the real world. Time to play the game. Now, that would be totally great if the game rules were very consistent, but they're not. Um, this is a post APOC world setting, and it should have been, you know, I, that's where I should have been slavering to stay. But by the time the first third of the book is gone, and I mean there's literally a third of the book you have to run through before you even get into the game. And I'm one of these people that say, get into the game within 10% of the book. If you're gonna do it, do it. If, if, you're, if you don't, there better be a damn good reason why it takes you so long to go into it. A third of the book to get into the game is a lot. You know, you can do traces of it or hints of it or, you know, lay out some groundwork for it. Something, you know, like they, they, they know the game, they detail the game as they're talking to somebody or they're thinking it through their head. It's just so the game has relevance before you get into the game, okay? But I really like to see something happening in the game before a third of the book, before half of the book, before three quarters of the book. 
otherwise it doesn't it doesn't jibe with me get into it so a third of the book goes by before i ever see the game actually happen okay so thankfully that is where the gaming starts which is at the third and as the end of the game things have no consistency and that kind of takes away from my overall enjoyment um, i'll give you an example uh of something that literally made no sense to me when I played like World of Warcraft or EverQuest or any kind of RPG electronically online or even just regular RPGs, even video games, I might get an autumn item. I might get an autumn. It's not even fall yet. And I'm thinking autumn. It's so damn hot outside, people. Anyway, I might get an item that was beyond my level. Like say I'm level 15, but somehow, and I'll give you a good example, in EverQuest, um, my brother helped me get this thing called a Whirlwind Axe. Uh, and, and my brother and I never played together. He played his game, I played mine. Uh, we, we just never had time because we, were, we worked different shifts. He lived in his house, I lived in mine. So he worked days, I worked nights, so we were never home. So on a weekend one night, he's like, hey, he called me up, I'll help you go get this whirlwind axe. So I get it, and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do because I'm too low level to actually employ what it's supposed to do. So you can get an OP uh, you know, weapon most times in those kind of games, but you can't equip it. Or if you can't equip it, it doesn't work until you reach a certain level. Like, you have to be XYZ level in order to, to actually have it activate or work, okay? So I couldn't even use that until I was a lot stronger. Most games are like that to keep a balance, okay? The Lady of the Lake didn't give 15-year-old Arthur old Excalibur, okay? Arthur had to get Clarence, which was the sword that he pulled from the stone and the anvil, because there was an anvil, and then the, the anvil was on top of a stone, and they drove the, the, the sword through the anvil and, and stone, um, and then he had to come up and take Clarence out, pull that out, become the king. A lot of people confuse it. Arthur had a lot of different swords. The two most famous ones are Clarence and Excalibur, okay? Now, the Lady of the Lake gave Arthur later the sword Excalibur in order to defeat Mordred. And that was only when he was really in need. He kind of had to level up and face a crisis in order to get Excalibur. So most games operate on that kind of a premise. You can't be first level and get like, I won't call it a 50 level sword, but a sword that would be used at 50th level at first level and, and be able to employ it with, you know, impunity, okay? Like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm first level and I'm going to whack everybody and everything around me because I've got this magical sword that does 500 points of damage every time it hits and it never misses and it ignores armor. It doesn't work that way, okay? This book does that right. I mean, it's just, it does it. So it's, I'm just saying, um, it, it, it's kind of an issue with me. And so in order to get the loot, you kind of have to struggle through things. And that's how it should be. Here, a lot of the OP stuff is dished out and disrupt, disrupts the entire game just because, okay? I just don't see the point to it. I think a lot of the issues, um, the biggest issue, story-wise, is also that the book is fairly short. It's under five hours, and it takes more than an hour and a half to get into the game portion of the story. That's like 1.6 hours that sets up everything. And by that point, I was almost wondering if I cared if they were actually going to get into the game. I kind of was interested in the real world. And there were a lot of things happening there. And then when I got into the game, I was like, the real world was more interesting than this one. I don't know what they were doing, but it just didn't flip over as well as it should have so i don't know if i read the book maybe it would it wouldn't quite seem so long you know because a shorter book you go through it and it just seems like boom 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 things go faster and that's great but for an audible credit for a five-hour book it better blast my socks off and not turn my lights off okay the book has a good premise and some really cool stuff that you may not want to miss and if i had one complaint about the writing style it would just be that it was written in first person and it takes a great narrator to overcome that for me okay first person is not my favorite thing Anne rice i read Anne rice and i hate first person i did it okay there are other people that write first person and i can't read first person okay i, I tried um first person is not my gig although i have written a short story in first person i really don't think i will ever do that as a preference or want to because uh, if you read splat it's told first person pov but I don't like it. It's very difficult to do that. You can't do transitions and changes and go tell other parts of other people's stories to do this. Um, so for me, it takes a really good narrator um, 
to kind of elevate that for me to be able to listen to it. Um, another one would be like the uh, uh, System of Apocalypse by, by Dao Wong, or even like Sandman Slim, if you've ever read that. I, I tried to read Sandman Slim. I love the series, and there was like a point five book that came out that never got audio treatment, and I tried and tried to read it, and I can't do it. I don't know how the first book, I tried that, and I said, if, it, if I can't listen to it on Audible, I'll never never be able to hear the series. And and somehow the narrator made it all make sense. To me, it was a bunch of sentence fragments and broken stuff, and just it was craziness, and it, it just was a jumble of words. I, I just don't know how to describe it any other way. The narrator picked it up, okay? So, like, for, for System of Apocalypse, System of Apocalypse, um, I wouldn't read the book, but I can listen to it, because the narrator does a great job okay yeah you know, even monster hunters if you ever read monster hunters inc oliver wyman there is 99 percent of the book is first person the only time it changes over is in the first book is when owen uh, actually jumps out of his body and is encountering an old man who's giving him advice um so that is a good one uh you know so i, I will give credit where credit is due pavisic is hamstrung by hang Man, try saying that really fast three times. Like, okay, just just saying, it's not easy. So, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that I I think the book had a lot of potential. It had good points, but I just think that the narration tanked it for me in ways that it it really wasn't fair to the story. Uh, you may like it if you've listened to the clip. You, you've heard the clip up there. And if that doesn't bother you or you're okay with it, listen to it. You'll probably like it. Um, I have things that I know that, and it's it's just with me. Like, I know, just just as an example, Ramon is not into, like, body horror kind of stories. Um, really grotesque stuff happening. He It's not his cup of tea, so he, he avoids that. And I'm the same way with certain things with, like, lit RPG game, gamelet. I'm very forgiving on, like, what is considered to be lit RPG or game lit. As long as it's got, like, stats and they're in a game, I'm cool with it. Okay, he's got, like, a lot more um, detailed requirements for it to be considered that in his eyes. For me, um, I have to have, like, intro into the game early enough that I'm not wondering when the hell I'm getting to the game. That's a big thing for me. It's a big factor. So my final score uh, is 6.8 stars. Uh, the story does have heart, and it's got a lot of prep promise, but the lengthy time it takes you to get into the game and the lackluster narration stunts its possibilities before they can take root in your mind, at least in my mind. It was it was a, it really hampered me in many ways for me to get into this, this book. Um, and then it's over before you know what happened. And I'm like one of these people that will always tell you, I like a good short story. I love short stories. Short stories are great. But this really needed to be a bigger book. I mean, like, 50,000 words. It, it just kind of seems like this is a tentative step forward to test it out. Flesh it out. Make it be more. Make it better. You give it another 30,000 words. If you've already done 50, another 20,000 even, or 25, isn't going to hurt you to flesh out your story. Flesh out your characters. Do more. You know, a, a really good example is like Secret of the Old Ones by Blaze Corvin. Blaze has a very stripped down kind of tale with the Luxstat strategy, Secret of the Old Ones. But it works because he keeps in everything that's essential and discards everything that's not. So for me, if you got rid of all the the outside world stuff and got into the game, then you're really, you know, you're a third of the book. So you, two thirds of your story is all that's left over. You know, you can't strip down a whole lot, okay, from that story and have a story left over. So, just inflate this, and it might have even been better. But, like, I have to go back, and I know watching Ramon years back, and before I started doing reviews, he'd be like, well, you know, it's it's X amount of dollars, and it's not very much, you know, so I don't know if it's worth your time. Because I get it. You, you've got a credit, and that credit will buy you a $50 you know, Audible, or it'll buy you, uh, you know, a $12 Audible book. Doesn't make much of a difference for them. But for you, you know, like Galaxy Outlaws, that's a 70-plus hour book, um, or even longer. I can't remember exactly how long it is, for one credit. I mean, you get like 70 hours, okay? Wandering In, Part 2, 60 
hours, 60 for one credit, okay? 60 hours for one credit versus one credit for under five. You really kind of have to see what you're, you what you want, what you like, what you're interested, we're interested in. So for me, a lot of factors played into this score. Again, I'm not trying to be harsh. Pavisic can tell a story. It was hard for me to get through because of the narration, and there were a couple other factors that played into it, but 6.8 stars. So next up is Mythian, The Chronicles of Ethan, book one by John Monk, narrated by... Travis Baldry, oh yeah, with a book length of 5 hours and 35 minutes. Okay, so I think the theme for this show this week is mostly going to be, with the exception of Dungeon World, which will be coming up shortly, um, <laughs> is shorter stories. For some reason, I, I didn't mean to do it this way. I just have reviews. I've, I've got to get them in here and do this and record. And the ones I picked out, I didn't realize until midway through three out of the four that I picked. I mean, three out of four are all shorter stories. So this is a good way to contrast a lot of my thoughts on this whole, should it be a longer story or not? So today I'm going to go into it and tell you again here, here's my thoughts on Mythian. So listen to this promo. There was a sign over the doors, the slaughtered noob. Beneath it hung a picture of a man in a tunic like mine with a pouch hanging around his neck. A spear pierced the man's chest, pinning him to the wall of the establishment. Just to the right of the door was another sign reading, No Minions. I felt a strange sense of shyness, as if walking in would draw all eyes to me. I tamped it down and pushed through the unlocked doors into an old-fashioned bar with rustic tables and chairs. The walls were decorated with threadbare tapestries of terrified adventurers in tunics being chased by monsters. Runic tracery in the ceiling provided a faintly yellow illumination. First date lighting, Melody would have called it. From what I could see, it was needed. Unlike the heroes on the streets, with faces and bodies every bit as beautiful as Magda's, the twenty or so human men and women sitting at the tables ranged from plain to downright unattractive. Huh. Okay, so here, here is how it's done. I just reviewed Starter Zone, okay, and I said how the book length influenced my score. Totally stand by it. Totally. I'm a firm believer in getting into the action or the game quickly. Most times, I don't care about the real world, and if I actually like your real, real world portions more than your game stuff, then you're probably writing the wrong story, okay? Here, now, like I say, I do like short stories. I love them. I grew up reading anthos and novellas of numerous genre and firmly, firmly believe that if you can tell a good story in 60,000 words or, or less, you're doing great. I think you can do it. It's not hard. 60K is very easy to achieve. And the good is the part that is the kicker. Luxstat strategy, secret of the old ones. I'm going to be talking about it in a lot of different places today um, by Blaze Corvin. It's under five hours in length and is one of the best novels I've ever listened to. So I know it can be done. So first of all, and I have to say this, I am loving Travis Baldry finding his way into the genre. I really came to respect his work in a book that he did called Dog Walker. It's another five-hour novel that grips you from the second you start listening and is a powerful indicator that Baldry has some serious chops. Dig it. Seriously. The man can tell a tale. Go get this book and read Dog Walker. Just, just to kind of like cleanse your palate. It's a short story. Five hours, but it's brilliant. And he brings his bountiful bag of vocal skills to bear on Monk's work. And the man doesn't just do it justice. He cracks that gavel better than Judge Wapner. <sighs> okay. Judge Wapner, if you don't get the reference, just look it up, youngins. Okay? It was a good joke. And I, I really had to think about that. And I, I spit it out perfectly. Okay? But yeah, he, he bangs that gavel better than Judge Wapner. It's, it's a little dated. It's for more older people. But I'm sure they, they will get a chuckle out of it. Anyway, Baldry animates the tale the way that a good story should be told. And in audio, that is like gold press latinum. Yeah, I was like on a DS9 kick while I was back with my mother. She watched the whole marathon, so I had to sit in a room with her and watch Deep Space Nine for two days. So yeah, I've got gold press, 
gold pressed latinum on my mind. Okay, so forgive me. Now, Monk's Tale is not the OCD detective. Okay, it's not about him at all. It, it, but John Monk will feel familiar to some of you if you've recently watched or seen promos for the new series on Amazon called, I think, Upload. If I'm not mistaken, it's called Upload. Um, Monk came first, by the way. Okay, he, he told his story prior to Upload. In his world, you can retire into a gaming world or even worlds if you so opt. Uh, and it's for the rest of eternity, or at least until the power gets shut off somewhere, I guess. I don't know. But there are bazillions of different places that one can go to after they die. But the MC opts for a world called Mythian because his wife is rumored to be stuck there, okay? Now, I don't want to give away any more, and that's all I want to say about it, but um, it is not a nice way of going into this world, okay? It's kind of like uploading that aspect of things. If you've seen Upload, you kind of get an idea for what the world is outside of the game, Mythian, um, for, for Ethan, okay? So there you go. But Monk came first, okay? The book then revolves around the main character, the protagonist, Ethan, acclimating to his new world and looking for clues to his wife's whereabouts. My only complaint is that this is very much a slice-of-life story, and I'm not a big fan of slice-of-life. I try. I have grown to appreciate them more as time has moved on, but I am definitely a story that believer that a story needs a point A, point B all the way to point Z and then you can leave it open for book two uh, but it should be a complete succinct tale and not just feel like you're wandering around so this is kind of like a slice of life to some extent okay um, Ethan does have goals but it really doesn't feel like you, you know going into it okay he's not going to find his wife in book one uh, and, and if that's the case I could be wrong I haven't read book two yet but probably not in book two. Most likely he gets to his wife somewhere, I'm guessing, in this trilogy. Book three, I'm thinking. So, you know, until then, it's going to kind of be a wander around kind of deal. So it's a slice of life. So if that's your, your cup of tea, if that's your cuppa, this is going to be perfect for you. Okay? For me, I'm not really big on slice of life stories. But yes, Ethan does have goals. Um, and But most of the book is just him trying to figure out how to level up. He has to level up for very specific reasons to a specific level uh, in order for him to advance to where he needs to get for the next step, so to speak. Now, I don't want to go into it because it's it's part of the story. Um, so essentially, the book is just grinding. Not that it's just grinding because... Ethan does have companions that he, he kind of grows with. Uh, he evolves. They become friends. So there's characterization. There's drama. All that good stuff you like in a story. And it's all right there. Um, so, you know, it's not just grinding. It just feels like it's just grinding because the story kind of just goes from this to that to that. But it's a slice of life. Okay. Uh, I did like the party that he acquired. And I found it humorous that the NPCs, for example, are completely and utterly fed up with having to do their jobs. They've done the same thing a billion times every day for the last billion years, okay? Uh, they they just are not, you know, happy campers of, you know, yep, I'm going to sell this shoe and I'm not going to haggle about it anymore, I guess. If you want to haggle, I'll haggle. Oh, just take the shoes and go. That's kind of their attitude. Like, I'm stuck in this this rut. And it's, it's pretty slick. It's pretty smart. Um, you know, so... I do have to suppose that if I were dealing with noobs every day, day in and day out, it would become irritating, and, and I would probably feel the same exact way in many respects. But thankfully, I'm not an NPC. I would be the gamer, and so they could suck it. That's all I can tell you. Um, now, one thing I do have to warn you about is that the book ends on a really big cliffhanger, one hell of a cliffhanger, um, and it sort of deviates from where you'd expect the story to go after some buildup. Um, you know, you kind of go, well, wait, wasn't, um, what? Huh? Um, so personally, I don't mind cliffhangers, but I generally expect them, you know, in slice of life stuff. I, I really do, um, because a slice of life kind of has to do that in order to maintain everything that's happening. Okay, because you're you're not going from point A to point Z. You're kind of just saying, okay, this is what's going to help us get to the point Z whenever the story ends. Um, and again, I think Monk has a, a nice little trilogy on his hands. So hopefully, at some point, it, it, it's going to it's going to play out that way. Um, I'm giving this a, a, a 7.9 stars. Okay, I'm very much intrigued as to what's going on, but I wish it had been um, more of an accomplish this task and then move on. 
move on kind of story um, than it was just kind of feeling around um, and getting things done because it, the the biggest issue I have is uh, Ethan is one of these people that goes in the world completely clueless and, and and I would just say if I have to pick a flaw in anything or any way of thinking um, the man knows he's going there he's specifically chosen that place to go uh, he is going there for a very valid personal reason, something that means a lot, and he takes absolutely zero time, I mean zero time, to do any kind of inspection or uh, learn about the game. I mean, he literally goes into it and he's like, I have no idea what's happening to me right now, because the minute he gets into the game, bad things start to happen. And it's because he doesn't know anything he has no clue what's happening to him why it's being done or how you know how he can avoid it um had he read a, a little bit he might have understood something a little bit better and and that's like i know a lot of times i have a lot of people tell me i enjoyed this book but the mc was clueless here he is clueless admittedly because he didn't do his diligence and and actually study a little bit you know how many of us would i don't know i i know i would i would if i knew i was going to a world um and that there were repercussions for things that happened. You know, like, I've only got a 1,000 lives. Well, I don't want to lose a life, let alone 999, and then start worrying about how I'm going to survive for eternity from that point forth. Um, or if I've got only five lives left, you know, so on and so forth. I'm going to really learn my stuff, and I'm not going to worry about figuring it out on the fly. I generally do that when I play video games. When I go on to, like, just for example, Skyrim. The first time I played Skyrim... I did not do any... I hated going through the tutorial. I hated it. I, like, wandered around for two hours before I completed it because I was just trying to figure things out on my own and not have them force me to go this route. I hate that stuff. I hate it. Um, but if I'm going into the world to live forever, it's a bit different. Um, so, like I say, the story's really good. I, I think Monk does a really good job writing. He's got really interesting characters. Um, and Ethan... Um, is somebody that you know I could I could see like having a coffee in the morning with and chatting over and, and and figuring stuff out in that world before going out into the you know take care of stuff every day you know I, w I would hang out with Ethan a lot so it's a seven point nine um, and and I really do want to read the next couple of books so uh, check it out I haven't haven't gotten that haven't even gotten those books yet so dig it because uh, you will enjoy this book so the next book is Dungeon World which is book. Five of the Dungeon Core Experience, uh, written by the amazing Jonathan Brooks, narrated by Miles Miley, uh, and it has a book length of 12 hours and 11 minutes. It wasn't precisely a light elemental. It was something worse. Celestial Orb, level 1. Vitality, 40,000. Attack, 2,000. Sunray, blinding light. Solar Flare, external combustion. Defense, 3,000. Fred likely hadn't noticed it before because it was approximately 100 feet off the ground, and he hadn't been looking up. With Fred more focused on what was in between him and his territory, the wavy distortion in the air had gone unnoticed. Now his inattention might result in them all dying. Run! Don't stop! Rhodey screamed returning to step in front of Raven just as another bright streak of light erupted out of the 50-foot-wide glowing sphere. He caught it on his shield just before it hit the assassin's spy in the face, though the force of the intense light knocked him back a few wobbly steps. Well, folks, here again we wrap up another story, and I find it simultaneously sad and yet satisfying. It's kind of like the last chip in the bag, or, you know, the last cookie in the jar. It's good, but you miss it when it's gone. Brooks has taken us on a nice little journey through the life of Fred Winkle Mossering. Um, and again, and I'll say this later on, that's a name that... If you can remember that, you know it's a good story. And I've remembered Fred Winkle, Winkle Mossering since book one. Like, standout characters, even if it's a weird name, you know, Winkle Mossering is not typical um, of characters that you would know. I've never met a Winkle Mossering ever, but I could be wrong. Maybe there are a bunch of people out there somewhere that have that last name. If so, power to them. Um, but it stands out. I remember it because it's a good series and he's an interesting character. So, Fred Winkle Mossering and his quest 
to finally bring peace to the Dungeons and Humans, which has been so long in the coming, kind of comes to a conclusion. And I say kind of because there is an ending that kind of leaves a door open. And I'll talk about that at the end of the, the thing here. But anyway, um, I have to say that his explanation of what happened to cause such rifts in the two races was very well crafted. Um, and it shows you just how far back J Jonathan Brooks had this story planned out, okay? This is not a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants kind of tale. He said, okay, here's the world, here's what happened, this is why Fred and his, you know, Fred's mother and father had him, what his, what his existence means, all of that, all mildly hinted at from book one all the way up until book five. And it all comes together quite nicely, quite nicely. Now, there were a few things that I really loved, and a few that I did not. But I want to talk about Miles Miley first. All right. Miley has really carried this series for me. I appreciate his skill and the plum, with, which was what made the story fun. Okay. Um, he, he is a perfect fit here. And he displayed excellence at every turn. I love listening to him. And he did a great job. Good on you, Miles. Um, there are a few times I can say, you know, that this narrator embodies or epitomes the spirit of the series and i'm not going to go into who i think there's because there's a bunch of them like that okay and i do that periodically so if you listen to the show you'll know i'll say so and so is the only person that could have ever voiced this series or this character um but miles this is his his baby okay uh he brought fred and everybody else to life okay so just Bear in mind, as we get through this, I enjoyed him 100%, no issues whatsoever. As for the story, there's a couple things I want to talk about. Just a few things. One thing, and I'll say that bothers me, and it isn't just Brooks that does this, and so it's not a bang on him, um, is a lot of authors will do this, and that's to skip over older supporting cast members in favor of new ones. And I'll give you an example. In this book... Three of the closest people to Fred, especially early in his life, were DC, Issa, and the man who, who took him in and taught him about what it meant, it meant to be human, okay? Um, and in these last two books, Issa, Fred's love interest, is barely there other than, you know, worrying about Fred, okay? Um, she's really not there. DC uh, pops up periodically to maybe help and supply some thoughts on dungeon matters and fight, but otherwise almost in the shadow of the books altogether. And his friend is all but overlooked in favor of some of the new shards. Now, I get that new people need some attention. Okay, I get it. But it seems like the people that Fred is closest to get very, very little time. And they're the ones that I, as the reader, care about more than the new people because they're new and I don't have an attachment to them. And again, it's not Brooks alone that does this. This happens a lot of times. Um, you know, I, I'll just say, you, you know, like w with uh, William Moran and his, his fabulous super sales on superheroes. Um, we got to book three, and in book three, it was almost like one character kind of took the stage forward. And the whole time I kept saying to myself, oh, this one has to be a bad guy, it's got to be a villain. Because it just doesn't seem like the motives are clear and crisp and clean. And there, there's got to be something underlying because we're not seeing anything from anybody, okay? And again, I said that in my review. Early, way way back when I said that, okay? So just the fact that all the other characters got shunted away in favor of this one new character, it, it totally like threw my reading experience off, okay? And again, you're allowed to do whatever you want as an author. But as a reader, I have to tell you how I feel. And I really wanted to see a little bit more between Fred and Issa before, you know, all this other stuff happens. I kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of like Sam and Diane. Will they, won't they, will they, won't they, will they, won't they? And that's a Cheers reference for anybody that doesn't know. Um, Sam and Diane are probably the prime examples of the, the drawn-out, Will they get together? Won't they get together? Story. Um, yes, we knew that Fred and Issa were going to get together from book one. If you, you paid any attention, you kind of had that impression to start with. It was just a matter of when was it going to happen. And by the time it happens, you're kind of like, wait, did I, did, did I miss something? I, 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 how did that happen and it's over with already? Um, so that was kind of pulled back from and way further than what I would have liked it to have been um, because the the other two the, the people that were from the 
the, the city, I really couldn't have cared less about them. If they had died on the way back to the, you know, from the from the front line battles, uh, well, it was just one more character that died. And I get that he needed more shards, and I get that um, th- things had to happen a certain way. But if, if I recall correctly, and I'm just pulling this up, the book is 12, 12 hours long. Uh, you know, adding in another hour of, of something to kind of flesh out a little bit more wouldn't have hurt the story. Not to me. I really wanted to see some, some connections and some farewells or hellos or here's what we're doing kind of, you know, with those earlier characters. Okay. So just that's all I'm asking for when something like that happens. So don't, don't neglect characters who've been around. In favor, and, and I'll give you a really good example who doesn't do this is Chris Carney. If you read his his series, um, even though uh, you know you know he's got a, a huge supporting cast, uh, everybody at some point has something to say. They're touched upon, uh, even if the main character doesn't show up. All the other characters do, okay? Um, and some might be shuffled off here or there, but they come back and they surge forward in the next book. In the next story, they have more of a, a presence, uh, so on and so forth. And I never feel like they're being neglected at all. Um, Axe Druid, okay? Great team-building book. I don't feel like there's characters that are being neglected. Here, it just kind of just felt like, Issa needed more time with Fred. Okay, I'm just being honest with you. I'm such a romantic. That's how I am with life. I just think people need love, and it should be shown. I'm just saying, you know, and again, I'm not trying to tear down Jonathan Brooks, but a little bit more there would have helped me a lot to appreciate the story because I kept wondering why these other people were being focused on than that. So that's my ramble on there, okay? I rambled, and I get it, okay? Um... So, like I say, just a few thousand more words, it could have been easily achieved. Um, so, you know, and to me, that's like, and I, I guess I have to re- reiterate this. It's kind of like if you read Dresden Files, because Dresden Files just came out and it made me think of that. Um, it would be like having a story in the Dresden Files without Murphy ever showing up or being mentioned at all. Okay, Karen Murphy is integral to the plot. Um, I mean, even Susan, uh, the, the mother of his his child, is mentioned briefly, periodically, and never forgotten after her death. And forgive me if it's a spoiler, but the books have been out without another book coming out for five years, so you've had plenty of time to read those books. Um, each of those those characters are mentioned or brought forth or remembered, and most of the characters in his stories all get airtime periodically. You know, even even the carpenters, or even if if like Michael doesn't show up, they're mentioned or they're thought of, or whatever. So like you know, they're they're going to be there. And this was the final book, so that's where I just kind of had to do that. Just had to say it. Okay. Secondly, the dungeon war, and again, this is my only other beef with the book. The dungeon war stuff felt a little repetitious. I believe Fred started defending his territory about two books back. And the style of the battle never really changed. Um, it was, you know, one type of dungeon monster enters, um, and it's shunted through various rooms, and they get their numbers whittled down, and then they are stopped. And it was a sort of a, a rinse, repeat, and that was, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. And that was fun the first time it happened. But I, I, I've been there before, and I would have liked to see something a little bit different. Like, yes, Fred does create some cool monsters, and he managed to suss out a lot of things about mana versus essence that might have been better served out in the field without collapsing his territory and giving the battle a hint of freshness. So, like, yeah, there's things that happen with, like, mana bombs up on the walls of the city. That was really cool, and it was interesting, but the, the, the below-ground stuff had just been done. I mean, like, this was, like, the, I think the third book that we had that kind of a fight and i would have liked to seen some stuff shift up and i get like the dungeons were sending one row after another of, of things happening but fred should have in my mind changed things up a little bit like changed his strategy or defended differently uh than just letting that happen in that capacity so you know that's the only other beef i really had um you know so there you go as for the good stuff uh, mm-hmm. Um, Fred's revelations about the past, uh, the damage uh, that was done therein, uh, and his role attempting to heal both the wounds of the world as well as those of the humans and the dungeons, you know, 
that all kind of like is very captivating. And Fred coming to terms with his role in the world, his willingness to sacrifice his own health or happiness in order to save everybody else is exactly why Fred's a great character and why you care about Fred so much. Um, you know, um, you know, the, the sacrifices he was willing to make was very heartwarming, and everything he did for others was always for others. And he, I don't think Fred ever thinks of himself. The crafting of various spells and the way that they figured out how Fred could see an air spell so he could learn it, um, that was cool as ice. I mean, that was really awesome. You know, like Fred, Fred like has to see a spell in order to figure out how to work it, um, and having them say, well, here's the air spell, and he goes, Whoosh, and he can't see the wind. Having them figure it out was really cool. I, I enjoyed that. They were all great moments. There's a lot of great moments in this book. Uh, the book is really good, and it had an excellent ending and even left open possibilities of further books in the future. Uh, I still would have liked a bit of a bigger bang somewhere in the middle of the book, you know, somewhere else, just so it was it had like a bigger, more powerful ending. Uh, but I think it ended well with just a, needing a little bit more characterization is all. But it ended well and, and had a, a lot going for it that you don't see um, most days, you know, as you, you go through these kind of things. The story is really good. High concept, very well executed. Um, now, the only other thing I will say, and, I, and again, it's not a, a bad thing, is the, the door that's left open is probably one I would close. Uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I think there's better ways to continue on because we, we do have things that happen at the end that, that do show, you know, what happens between Fred and Issa and so on and so forth. And I think that um, the ending is good. And we I would love to see more in this series. Jonathan, love this series. Love this book. But I don't like the, the concept of, well... This one, uh, this one thing is still out there that could possibly be a problem. I would leave that dog lie. I, I would leave it lie uh, and, and do something differently because that's it's just kind of, I don't know, I, I don't like that concept at all. But again, I trust that if you do do that, you'll do it well. So my final score is eight stars. Um, like I say, the only thing that made me take it down a, a notch or two, uh, a couple degrees, is the fact that the dungeon fighting was a little repetitious for me. And, and like I say, I needed a little bit more character development with the other characters. I needed to see them a little bit more. I felt really bad that I didn't get a lot of them in there, you know. So that's it. So otherwise, eight stars, great series. If you ask me for this overall series, I'm going to say probably an 8.6. It's a great, great series. I enjoyed the series completely. So whole series, 8.6. Final novel, eight stars. Okay, for our sound booth spotlight today, I have Star Nova Online Book Zero, Closed Beta, by Noah Barnett, uh, narrated by Justin Thomas James, Annie Ellicott, and Jeff Hayes. Uh, it's a book length of three hours and 58 minutes. Day one. Login. Loading Star Nova Online. Closed Beta. Logging into private test server. A ball of cells divided in a headlong bid for life. A human body taking shape within the tank of blue-green amniotic fluid. Player ID, NA1339872. Registered name, Charlie. After the orientation, you will meet with your wingmates, and a fighter will be assigned to you. You are all here for a reason. The aliens have lost their logistical base on Mars. We fear that they will use planetary bombardment should they reach Earth's orbit. Okay, so here again, I have to be honest, the book was a bit of a surprise for me in a lot of ways. First, it's short. I mean, short. Gunmeister Online was 14 hours long, okay? This book clocks in at under four. Under four. Now, I like short stories, but, you know, um, basically, a four-hour book that is sort of a sequel needs a little bit more for me, okay? Um, it basically felt like all the focus was on the gameplay and not the characters to me. I think that the characters could have been more fleshed out. And I think Noah, and God love him, he's a great writer. I think he's fantastic and he knows how to write. Um, felt that we knew the characters from his 14-hour-long book, you know, The Gunmeister Online, because they were all carried over into this one. Um, so there was really no need to kind of do descriptions of, like, what's going on in their heads as much as he would 
for a larger novel, like a 150,000 word novel, which is where I think Gunmeister kind of came close to at some point. Um, so, you know, it, it's more about the game and what happens in the game than it is about the characters. And, and to me, um, you can do that. You, you can, you can do a lot of stuff you can do. Like here's the, the, the story, uh, the action supersedes the characters because it's more about like events than it is about characters. You can have people there, they do things and then, then they're, they're killed or they survive. And that's great. But I like a good character driven story more than anything. Characters are what, um, if, if you ask me like in a book, what stands out? And I can tell you a really great book by the fact that I can remember the characters' names. Because I read a lot of books, and there are a few times I can pull somebody's name right out of my head automatically. I mean, it's really tough. Um, just because I read so many stories, a lot of times the stories blend together. You know, like you'll say, okay, I know, you know, oh, I, oh there's, there's Cal from the Divine Dungeon. Because I love Divine Dungeon. Or I know there's Grimjack from Viridian Gate Online. Oh, or there's Lee from, you know, um, War Eternus. So those are characters I can remember because they were interesting characters. They were cool characters. Uh, I enjoy them. They stand out. Um, if you just came in off the street and jumped into this book, I don't think you'd have that, that same feeling. And again, Noah is a really good writer. And I don't want to... To, to toss anything on him about this. I'm just saying the book's short and it's more about the, the, the gaming stuff. I would have liked to have had more characterization in this story just because, because there are some things that are touched upon from the first book um, into the second book, mainly with like the old, the old guy that had cancer and, and how he, he is kind of dealing with life anew in the next game. Uh, so on and so forth. So, you can only do so much with a battle, and when you win the war, you know, that kind of ends up being, that's the end of the book. If you win the war, if you lose the war, it's still the end of the book. <clears throat> so, yeah, some character growth and development to maybe kind of fluff out the book with nothing else would have been appreciated. And I say that, I mean, totally with love, because I loved his characters. I mean, there were some great characters, the crazy one, um, you know, the, the old Civil War guy. Those people were fun and exciting characters. And I wanted more of that as I was going through this. And it was just kind of very truncated with what was happening. And, I, and again, that's partly because the book is so short, okay? Um, secondly, the book is a complete departure from Gunmeister Online. Honestly, if you've changed the name of each character and a, a couple minor details were shifted around, it would make no difference to this story at all. Um, you know, Gunmeister, for example, had numerous characters that the MC had to struggle with. You know, uh, he had to... He had to earn things. Like there, there were a lot of characters that were guns. Okay, um, characters that he he fought to get, and then all that was like tossed out for this because he was only allowed to take one gun with him um, as a partner, and so or even to struggle with his friends. The cast here is pared down significantly because everybody had guns, and and each of those guns were alive and sentient, and so on and so forth. I'm um, here. It's kind of a bare bones story. Now I I know I probably already said earlier on um, in my first review of today. Um, Secret of the Old Ones is a great stripped down story that tells exactly what needs told, okay? But you still have characterization in there with the main character, the people that are in there, you know, who, who's hunting him, what their conflict is. All of that's in that book for a five hour book. Okay, but I'll, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Thirdly, a lot of the stuff in Gunmeister Online is kind of wiped out. Gunmeister Online was heavily adult style story. It was. It was a heavily adult style story. It was a, a full on, you know, not fade to black kind of tale, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, and SNO, you know, if you, if you buy this, uh, the Star Nova Online, you would be a little bit let down if that's what you're expecting. Um, the stuff that made GMO, Gunmeister Online, stand out, kind of gets shoved in a box and forgotten about. So, Again, like I say, it, it's almost like a completely different kind of book. If you just change names and a couple of things, it would be altogether different than what it was. And again, it's not a bad story. I will reiterate that for a fifth or sixth time. But it, it doesn't have that connection that I think that you need um, because everything kind of got flipped off or dialed down, you know, from what it was. Because, you know, just I wanted some some craziness. That's what I loved about Gunmeister Online, for example, was you know the craziness, the concept alone of you have to get a gun 
And then to keep it happy, you have to have sex with it. It's sentient. Um, so on and so forth. And if you haven't read Gunmeister online, I probably sound crazy. But it's a really amazing book, and you probably should check it out. Um, because it's got a lot of like really cool, new, neat ideas. And yes, I'm not from the 50s. Uh, and I'm not from Smallville, but I do like to use the word neat from time to time. It's neato. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, and, and, and if you do like the adult stuff, it's very graphic. you know. And if you don't, you can skip it. It's not hard. It's just, boom, you're done. And you can go on to the story. But if you're into that sort of stuff, it's a really good, wild book. It's crazy. Um, and, and a lot of that got dialed down here, and I don't know why. And again, I, I don't know what Noah was thinking when he, he made this a short story, if it was kind of a test run for a bigger series, you know, because I know he had plans with the aliens and so on and so forth, or if it was kind of like, okay, Gunmeister did great, but I'm kind of done with that story, so I want to end it here, and this is how I want to do it. I don't know, and I'm not going to speculate on that because I don't know what's coming. There may be another larger story coming out, and that would be fantastic. I really want to know more. I want to see more. But I also, um, I think we kind of need to step back a little bit into what made the book so great in the first place. Um, the new stuff, okay? SNO, Star Nova Online, is very reminiscent to me of Ender's Game insofar as the MC needs to learn to lead a squadron effectively to defeat alien invaders. Uh, he has a rival that doesn't like him, and he has a learning curve that feels like a roller coaster. So rather than having gunfights, all the players upgrade to like dogfights in space. They don't have sex on their spaceships or have sex with their spaceships, I should say. Like, you know, I would have expected that. Like, you know, okay, the guns are out, but um, you're going to get like different fighter ships. And each one of those have personalities, and you've got to wow them and woo them and make love with them um, just to keep them happy as you go. So he would build up a spaceship harem. That was kind of like what I was expecting here, and it, and it didn't happen. And I was kind of like mind blown uh, because there were things I thought were going to happen. And again, because I expected it doesn't mean I was let down. I was just kind of surprised that that wasn't where he went because it was a very easy transition to keep that naughtiness from the first book into here. And just for some reason, you know, Noah decided not to go that route which is fine. You don't have to be defined by sex in your books. But if you do it, expect people to expect it, and when it's not there, they're going to get a little miffed. So just a warning. Um, where was I at here in my head? Okay, SNO for me, starting over online, um, seems to lose all the cool stuff and deep characterization that Gunmeister had um, in order to basically alter the course of the series completely. And I think that's kind of why he did what he did. Um he wants to change where he was going. Like this was where he was headed. Then he had an idea and he said, I'm going to just kind of move over here instead of going this direction. I actually think it would have worked better if it had been a part of the first GMO Gunmeister online and been the true ending of the book. Yeah. I know Gunmeister was 14 hours. This one's not quite that long. So adding another four hours, to, to the book wouldn't have heard it. It would have just been like, okay, we've bumped up, and this is where we've, we've taken this book to the end. And then none of the stuff that I've complained about would have been lost. It would have been like, okay, we know the characters. There's no need to reintroduce them to people and kind of like give them more things to do with the personality-wise. It would have all been in your head from that book into there and pretty simplistic. So to me, I, I almost want to say this is like the part of the book that they, they trimmed it down to just make it a little bit shorter. And this got released just because, you know, Noah said, Hey, this is great, great stuff, but we couldn't have it there for whatever reasons. Okay. And believe me, I understand when, it, when you're told like, Hey, a book is too long, trim it back. Okay. Cause I write like a crazy person. I don't write 10 words, but I could write a thousand. Um, I don't know how to do short synopsises of things. So I can understand him saying, okay, look, this was there. I don't want to lose it. It's very relevant to what's happening next. But I can't put it at the beginning of the book. Let me release this as a standalone kind of story. If that had been said, I'd be okay with it. But again, we don't have that information, so I don't know. And I hate to speculate. But it would, book two wouldn't feel like such a departure if that had been the case. For what it's worth. Now again, I'm going to repeat myself again and again and again. The book is really good. Damn it, it's a good book. It tells a compelling, if somewhat succinct, tale. The problem is, is that it's very stripped down and deviates so much from its predecessor. That was my biggest 
problem with the book. But if you can overlook that aspect, you will probably love this story. Newcomers uninitiated to GMO, Gunmeister Online, will have no problem, none, zero, um, sinking into this story. In fact, I think they, I suspect that they would probably enjoy this more since they won't know what came before. So they'll enjoy it more than the person that read GMO, just because they aren't losing anything and are not wondering why things were, were done the way they were. Like I saw, say, GMO is really good, and Star Nova is good, but it feels like less like a continuation than a re-envisioning. And for me, um, I, I kind of need a little bit of a build-up and, and some more fleshing of characters to go, you know, it, it blew me away. And I, and I did enjoy this book, and I enjoyed it a lot, and I want to read the next book that he writes. I've got Enigmas online. It's lined up for reviews. I would be happy to get to it and tell you how great it is. Um, but I'm talking about the, you know, the GMO universe. I'm hoping Noah goes back. He writes a bit of a larger tale and we get, you know, some more answers and, and some changes and things like that, that kind of reunites the, the, the first story with the last story that he, he'll do. So my final score, and again, I've rambled a lot here. Is 7.8 stars. It's not bad. It's a really good story. It just for me, there, there were a couple of things I just kept saying, you know, I wish, you know, we, we didn't miss out on this or that. And again, it's only because I read that first book. If I had stayed away from it, I'd have come in and had a different idea. But again, it's that the book is, is four hours long. What do you think? So you have to balance that out too. So it's a shorter book for your credit. And, you know, it's a continuation, but it feels more like a re envisioning. So I had to, I had to kind of take some stuff off for there, but otherwise it would be like a much higher story, especially if it was a little bit longer and it was a little bit more fleshed out than what it was. And again, stripped down does not mean it's bad; it just means it's stripped down and it's a very well oiled machine. Okay, very well oiled. Seven point eight stars is not a bad score. Last, the time has come for us to say farewell and adieu for the time being. I hope you'll join us next time. Uh, possibly next week or in the week after, depending on my schedule, which has been utterly swamped and crazy. Uh, but as you can see, I am much more vivacious today. I'm more alert and conscious because I actually had eight hours of sleep uh, yesterday. So I've been really, really good today, and I'm, I'm jazzed up on power. Uh, I've had Mountain Dew. So I, I'm... <laughs> A little bit more more alert and awake and, and focused today. So, again, I'd like to th say uh, thank you to everybody. I do appreciate your support, taking your time to watch or listen to the show. And I'll just go through the list real quick. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Uh, and if you want, you can come to my house, and I'll be happy to read reviews to you live and in person for a small fee. I'm not really expensive, like 25 cents, and I'll read any review I've already done for you. Uh, so just let me know you're coming, because I may not be here otherwise. So that's our show. Thank you all for coming. Please, as always, I will remind you to leave a review if you've read a book. Uh, no matter how much you you loved it or didn't like it, leave a review. Just be honest and explain what issues you have. I try to always do that and say, here's what I liked about it. Here's what I didn't like about it. And if there's something you think that could have been changed, tell them that. Uh, because other than, otherwise, if you just say the book sucked, no one learns anything and they don't improve. Criticism, if it's critical and it's done properly, can really help improve a writer. So go out there and review a book if you've read it. Uh, again, thank you all for listening. And as I will say, keep listening to audiobooks.